Hi, everybody. <laughs> Enjoying your beer? <laughs> you know, in Italy, where I come from, we drink much more wine, but honestly, Japanese beer is great. I will have one later. Anyways, um, I know it's been a very tiring, exciting day. Um, I know I'm the last obstacles before between you and your Saturday night, so let's keep moving, okay? Um, today I would like to uh, discuss with you one of the many use cases for uh, serverless technology, and in this case we are talking about machine learning applications. Um, so before we get started, just a very quick introduction about who I am, what I do. Um, I'm Alex, <laughs> I'm an Italian musician and software engineer. Um, I have a computer science background and I've been working in web development for the last six, seven years and uh, I was really lucky to join Cloud, the Cloud Academy team in the very early days, three and a half years ago. Uh, so we built the platform for um, students all around the world that wanted to study cloud computing. Uh, you know, not just AWS, uh, you know, even other platforms that are really in getting super interesting. Um, so I don't know if you have ever met a data scientist before. Maybe many of you are data scientists. I like to say that they are very curious people that love numbers, and uh, they like to work in teams because it makes them more, even more powerful and smart in a group. And uh, what I want to like is that even if we are and they are data um, computer scientists and most of them are engineers too, they do not code all the time. So they do analysis, they do design tasks, data visualization, and of course we also love coding, but not all the time. So this is a, a background knowledge so that we know what's coming. So I would like to uh, tell you a little bit what does a machine learning pipeline outcome look like. Uh, so what happens, you take a few data scientists, you put them in a room, you give, you give them some time and a lot of data, and they will come up you know, with a beautiful machine learning model with a lot of data visualization tools and charts and uh, proof that the model works. And usually, uh, a beautiful prototype as well. So data scientists will build a model which is not typically production ready. So how do you take this prototype and deploy it to production? Uh, and how do you integrate it with your websites? How do you access these models? Because maybe you have many of them. How do you make them secure? How do you, uh, you know, integrate with the rest of the website? Usually this takes a lot more time and the help of other uh, people from the organization could be a web developer, could be a DevOps, could be another software engineers, and you know this takes a lot of time, and I believe it's a waste of time because data scientists are super smart, and if you give them the tool to be independent, to skip all the operations and inter integration step, they will be able to be much much more productive. So this is what I thought a few months ago at Cloud Academy when we started adding you know, smart um, features to our product with machine learning. And I struggled because I didn't want to go through the web operations steps. I wanted to move quickly. I wanted to add models deployed and tracked and, uh, you know, integrated as soon as possible in the platform. Um, so why does this waste of time happen? I, I call it the lack of ownership because you know, data scientists, DevOps, mm, web developers, they just have different skills, different mindsets, different um, goals in the organization. Um, so the more, you know, the more your code and your model get uh, far from you once it's deployed, the more you feel this lack of ownership. You know, it's too far away, I don't know how to check it, monitor it, change it, fix it if it's broken. So. I needed, I wanted to find a better way to deploy, test, integrate, and update our machine learning models into production. Um, one alternative could have been, well, let's use machine learning as a service. There are many amazing services out there, Amazon, Azure, uh, Google, IBM, and many others. Um, so this would, 
eventually allow you to remove the data scientist from your <laughs> organization at all, of course, I think you don't want to do it because you still need to explore your data to find patterns and uh, even if you have a fully working model, you always want to tune some parameters, you want to in a way have control over you know what's going on over your models and basically not everybody likes black boxes. So they're very useful if you have no idea what's going on, if you don't want to have any idea what's going on. But if you do and if you want to make it uh, you know the best solution ever uh, and if you are a data scientist, this is not ideal. Although it's getting better and they are adding many, many useful features to uh, machine learning as a service products. Um, so in order to show you that it's actually possible to build a machine learning model in a very few lines of code. So here is a, a couple of snipset, uh, sni uh, snippets that show you, you can train a model given a data set with four, five, six lines of code and then you can test it, you can show, like this was a binary classifier, you can show um, a multi-class classifier. You can show the confusion metrics and the, the quality of your model in a other four or five lines of code. So if you go at this link, there is a, the full file that shows you with 30, 40 lines of code, comments included. You can build uh, a, a very high quality model with libraries like scikit-learn and I, I mostly use Python but you can do the same in JavaScript, Java and many others. Um, so it is possible. The problem, as I mentioned, is that once you've built it, tested, shown that it works, it's not easy to put it into production. Um, the other problem is that if you do not use cloud computing technologies in general, even without serverless, you know, you have the old problem of, you know, you don't want to over provision, under provision, you never know. Uh, as other people said, how quickly you are going to scale, and machine learning applications have, you know, a different need in terms of computation. Mm, it's not that easy to scale. It's not that easy to integrate with other, uh, more common, you know, uh, web applications. Um, so this problem is really tough to solve most of the time. Um, so what would you normally do? Uh, well, you can integrate your machine learning model with your web application in the, the most classical way. Just, you know, add a new controller, load the model that you trained earlier, uh, maybe you serialized it into a file. So you can just deserialize it, load it into memory, and, you know, use it to serve new predictions uh, in your website. These are, these are so many problems you can't even imagine. So you have, um, um, you know, you are sharing resources with all the rest of the website. Um, of course, this doesn't scale. It doesn't matter how many servers you have. You are sharing processes. Python, JavaScript, doesn't matter. Um, you are sharing the authentication layer. You know, it's too much integrated into your website and you will not scale at all. Um, okay, let's put a lot of servers in place. Same problem, you're not elastic, you're not, uh, you never know if you're over provisioning or not um, and the same problems hold. Okay, let's do it automatic so you maybe are elastic but you're still sharing resources. You don't want your website go slightly slower just because you have a lot of machine learning, you know, matrix inversions and complicated computations going on. So this is still a very bad design. What you want to do is to maybe build a microservice, okay? And that's the, the, the path that we chose. Not to mention higher level features like you want to cache your model responses, you want to version your model, maybe you have hundreds of them and uh, maybe you want to have custom authentication uh, logics because you want to call your model from mobile application, from the web uh, browser, from the web server. So it's not as simple as it seems and if you are a data scientist, you seriously don't want to re-implement all of this from scratch. Um, so here it comes, the serverless machine learning idea. Why don't we use serverless? Why don't we use, for example, AWS Lambda, which is what we did a few months ago? Um, so what do you get for free? You get a RESTful interface, you get a pay-as-you-go model, completely elastic and highly available. 
Um, you don't have any more all the operational effort, and you know all of this. We have been talking about the same all day. You are achieving failure isolation, decentralization of your infrastructure. If you use the microservices architecture, it's really powerful. In this particular uh, application, you, you have, as I mentioned, you can achieve production-ready prototypes, which are really hard to, to achieve. So the prototype I showed you, you don't need to change it in order to deploy it to production. This will save you weeks of development because web developers, DevOps, have no idea about machine learning and you really don't want to mix uh, those skills and responsibilities. Um, so in the, in the configuration that we developed, uh, more or less you can think of one model corresponds to one microservice, which is a lambda function in our case. And of course we get versioning, staging, and caching for free, meaning we don't have to implement it. And we went for uh, offline training phase, meaning we can do everything we need to do offline. I I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few problems about this. Uh, and once you have trained the model, tested it on, offline, locally, wherever, you can just publish it online and it will work uh, more or less <laughs> easily. And also we like to A-B test our models because you know, you, the idea of choosing one single model, one single configuration most of the time is a blind guess or you know, it's quite a, empirical. So you want to A-B test many different variations or completely different type of uh, mod mathematical models. So A-B testing is really a, a feature we needed. Um, so I built a very, very simple example that you can find at this link. Uh, also on every slide on the top, on the bottom left, you can find a link to this, all, this very presentation so uh, you can get all the links afterwards. Um, so it, it's a very simple demo. We built a sentiment analysis model based on like a few million tweets. It's a public data set available from I think Berkeley University. And uh, so you can find the repository down here on GitHub. It's public. And also, let's, let me show you. So it's a super simple page. Uh, as many others have shown, you can host all of this into S3 and CloudFormation. Oops, a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Better. So all of this is hosted on S3 and, cloud and uh, CloudFront, of course. Uh, so it's completely serverless. The model, uh, the serialized model, is hosted on S3. And there is a Lambda function that pulls the model from S3 and will serve a new prediction in real time. Uh, so this is the API gateway um, resource that we are going to call. So if you, you, if you pass this text parameter uh, in the query string, you will have a response from the microservice. And this is a super simple course enabled RESTful uh, example. So we can insert some text like I love serverless, great, sentiment, positive, great. So what if we change it? I hate servers, right? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully this is negative, right? So it's just some text analysis. There is some normalization and you know NLP com computation, but it's nothing complicated. With a like one megabyte Lambda deployment package, you can have the Lambda, the Lambda function up and running. You can find everything and the instructions on GitHub. Um, so it's this is super simple, not an incredible demo, but shows you the power. You can do everything. And if I ask my data scientists of my team to build all the features needed, authentication and RESTful interface and uh, elasticity, they will they will take weeks to implement. Right. Um, so this is a super simple example, but what about a slightly more complicated example? So what do we do at Cloud Academy to, uh, what was our goal and how, why did we use uh, Lambda for machine learning? So we had in mind a multimodal ar architecture, as I mentioned, it means we have so many models, we, uh, we want to A-B test them, variations, and uh, sometimes it's just a recommendation engine, sometimes it's a binary classifier to understand if you will um, take a course or a quiz session or not. Uh, sometimes it's a bit of both together. Um, so we built 
one RESTful interface for each machine learning model with API gateway that's straightforward. And most of the time, you have one Lambda function for one model, but it's not always the same. Let's say that in one uh, Lambda function, you need to add uh, to have like a natural language processing model and a binary classifier. So you might need to integrate more than one model into one Lambda function. And that's why we used S3 and RDS for storage. I will tell you about RDS. This is not really useful in the, at real time. This is more for the training phase. And uh, we went for a periodic training strategy. I will tell you what it means. So it's all offline training. Uh, I can show you a little diagram. I hope it's clear. Um, this is more or less the setup. So our mobile application, website, and web server can access, can uh, call API Gateway and Lambda in our, with a RESTful interface, um, which will take the model from S3. And uh, of course, not at every invocation. You know, you can you can have like a local kind of cache on Lambda. So once you pull it, as long as the container is uh, is up and running, you don't have to pull the model the the S3 file again. Um, and we simply serve new predictions like that. What happens in the background is that we collect a lot of events. You know, what people, what our students do, which courses and videos they watch and every action that's made on the website and we send it through our data collection pipeline which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, all this data end up on our RDS uh, database. We use PostgreSQL. And so what we do is that periodically we take the data from RDS, we train our model, we aggregate, normalize, clean the data and we train our model and we simply push it you know, uh, upload it on S3. Um, we would like to do this on Lambda as well, but as you probably know, it's not uh, that simple to read f uh, to read uh, data from RDS and the Lambda. You need to be in the VPC. You need to have drivers, and also you have a five minutes uh, limitation, which is <laughs> almost never enough to train a complicated enough model. So we are still doing this in a in the old way with a, maybe a spot instance or a simple EC2 instance. Um, what we used to do in the previous version of this configuration is that we had, you know, after the training phase, we pushed the model within the Lambda function itself, you know, as a file in the deployment package. But we found out that the same model, the same S3 object, could have been used by many Lambda functions. So once you train a new version of the model, you don't want to update all the Lambda functions that use that model. So we just publish it on S3, and we added some more logic in the Lambda functions in order to check if the S3 file has been updated or not. You know, you can version files on S3. And so this is more flexible on our side. We train a new model, push it on S3, and all the Lambda function would be updated without actually updating the Lambda function code. So it is quite flexible. Um, also, the data collection pipeline is uh, serverless. Um, again, 99%. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you know about segment.com. It's a service that we use in order to, uh, let's say, broadcast all our events and our data and our records to third-party integrations like Google uh, Analytics, like Mixpanel, like uh, Intercom. And we also integrate um, a webhook that we bind it to API Gateway and Lambda. So every event that we send from every client or server will be processed by a Lambda function and stored temporary in a kind of a buffer, an SQS queue, um, which, you know, we could have used Kinesis, Kinesis, but two and a half years ago was not that stable. And unless you have the, like a terabyte scale data, it's not, it's a bit too expensive. So we went for a simpler SQS queue to use as a buffer, actually more of them, you never know. And then we have a fleet of servers of processes. This could be, actually we migrated this to a Lambda function very recently that will pull the data, transform it a little bit more and store it into, into RDS. So we can use this new data to periodically update the machine learning model. Um, okay, so this is 99% serverless now. And um, 
So this integrates with the whole picture. See how we collect data, store it, use it for new models. And uh, another interesting side is that, okay, now here I've put only one API gateway, one Lambda function. Of course, we have t uh, like 20, 30, 50 of them. And it's interesting that how do you A-B test models? Uh, so we decided to do it with Lambda as well. So instead of having like the clients calling directly the, r the right model, we have put a Lambda function in the middle. So you can, do, you can implement the A-B testing logic in a transparent way for the final model and then you choose uh, which model to invoke afterwards. This, we think, is a, the most flexible way to do it. If you have better ideas, please come to me afterwards. Um, so this is the collection pipeline. And of course there are some limitations. Um, you cannot do everything in this, in the, in, with this approach. You cannot do, for example, real-time models that you know, there are other tools like uh, Theano or like uh, TensorFlow that would allow you to dynamically process in real time new upcoming events and use them to serve new predictions without any retraining phase. So we achieved this with pseudo real time and for our scenario we didn't need uh, this kind of real time approach. Um, of course you have some <laughs> problems with the deployment procedure so if you use complicated libraries like scikit-learn or numpy or scipy, you have a lot of operating system dependencies uh, like <laughs> Fortran or C. So you need to take all those dependencies, uh, shrink them because they are too heavy and then uh, uh, push them together with your code and dynamically load them into the, the Python uh, runtime in order to make everything work because you cannot install any operating system library on Lambda itself. So this is a complication that took some time to solve, but a lot of developers have been doing the same and we found a solution altogether. Um, as I mentioned, Lambda is not currently suitable for training phase. You have the five minute uh, maximum execution time, which is not uh, great. Maybe they will increase it uh, or maybe we will just do it uh, offline on an EC2 instance. Let's see what happens. Another interesting problem is the uh, call start issue. I'm sure you, you know what it is. It, it means if your Lambda container is not up and running, it's not warm yet, you know, it takes a few seconds. It can take, I don't know, half a second, one second to warm it up. And if you have these heavy libraries, like scikit-learn in Python, it might take like one or two seconds just to load, just to import the library. So this is kind of a problem because the call start issue is bad, but with this approach it could get to like two and a half seconds. Um, so it's very long and it's hard to avoid at the moment. Um, the best idea is just keep your containers warm so they never, <laughs> uh, let's, we can't do anything uh, much more than this. Of course another problem is how do you, you know, keep everything together, how do you test, you know, unit test, integration test, uh, they really help if you do it locally, you know, when you have all the automation and the training phase and the publishing on S3, uh, you, you know, uh, it's hard to test, it's hard to make it uh, stable because uh, you, you can add some um, post-training phase tests to measure the accuracy and the precision of your models. but. You never know until they go to production. Uh, you can test it on the data you have, not on the data that's coming. Uh, so it would be nice to have some more integrated tools within AWS Lambda to, you know, to not re-implement all the testing uh, altogether by yourself. I'm sure new new things are coming up. Uh, I'm looking forward to them. Um, okay, this is it, and. Uh, I'm happy to inform you, by the way, that we very recently, I think two weeks ago, uh, released about 20 to 25 hours of video, finally, with Japanese uh, localization, with Japanese uh, captioning and subtitles, because we think training shouldn't be you know, constrained by the language. So we are trying to you know, take localization as a big step forward for our company in the next few months. Um, so here I would like to invite you with this, uh, with this link to you know, give us some feedback, uh, tell us what you think, 
and uh, it's just a gift that I would like to share with you. And um, so if you have any questions, I'm, uh, I'll be upstairs, and uh, please come and tell me what you think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex.